You're listening to the Full Core Press with your host, Drew Duncan. Don't you dare touch that dial. Right there, DB Dino Babers, Syracuse with a huge upset over the Clemson Tigers Friday night. I tell you what, first of all, obviously, as a longtime Syracuse fan, we had Don Brace from the 59 Syracuse national title team on here. There's a guy who's been talking about Eric Dungy for a long time. I'm glad he's finally getting noticed. Now, Eric Dungy for president, aka the Heisman Trophy. No, 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 no. That's not going to fly. We're, we're not going to get into that conversation. He's not quite there yet. But when it's all said and done, I think he will be an NFL talent. Now, I really believe that about Eric Dungy. Matter of fact, I know that about Eric Dungy. Is he going to come out of the draft this year? It wouldn't be wise. Uh, he doesn't have the stat line to back it up, first of all. Namely because of his concussions that he suffered in his first two seasons there. Uh, and, and he suffered those concussions because he plays like a wild man. Things I've been telling people is a little reckless. Uh, sometimes I love his ambition, but unfortunately there are moments when it gets the better of you. And, and I know you're trying to win a football game, but Eric Dungy, because of that, it's not going to have that clout and he's going to have that stigma on him. Like, dude, you know, you get a little nuts going into traffic. I like your fortitude, but are you willing to calm down? Can I teach you to calm down? That's the thing. You've got to be coachable. Look, it was a great win for the Syracuse Orange. I'm a longtime fan. I've got my 44 jersey at home. I got all that memorabilia at home. My Donovan McNabb autograph card from when he was at Syracuse. All that good stuff. But here's the deal. There's a loss to a team like Syracuse that Clemson could probably live with, being that the final score from the Syracuse LSU game actually was fairly close. Uh, being that Syracuse has made a couple of late little comebacks in the season and all those good things, uh, depending on how they do the rest of the way, if they're able to finish the season with an above 500 record, is also going to play into that. Uh, and besides, when you start looking at the Miami game uh, with Georgia Tech and it took that phenomenal catch in order to make that game work, I don't think it's going to be that bad. You start looking at all the losses that a lot of teams took over the weekend, massive amount of upsets happening between Friday and Saturday in college football. You had Auburn go down to LSU after they started out the game, what was it, 17 nothing, 20 to nothing, somewhere in that neighborhood. At Tiger Stadium, by the way, if I remember correctly, they were up by that many points, and they allowed a comeback. That was another top-10 team that went down. Washington, Washington State both lose. And I have been telling people for a long time, for a long time, Pac-12 was overrated. I knew this was bound to happen. USC didn't put up that good of a performance to me against Texas. UCLA had already lost to Memphis. It was only a matter of time. I've been saying it for the last, I don't know how long, every team in the Pac-12 is going to finish the season with at least two losses. There's no such thing as a legitimate contender in the Pac-12. Hell, you've heard me bag on the Big 12 as much as I have. I don't think there's anybody in the Pac-12 that can compete with anybody in the Big 12 that'll come out to a college football playoff. I don't think it'd happen. You lose to Memphis. San Diego State's coming in and running rough shot on you. Arizona State was Washington State's loss. And it wasn't just, or it was a Cal. You know, these teams are just coming in and beating up on everybody. And eventually, it catches up to you. Everybody, you know, oh, Washington State's actually a physical football team, and so is Washington. You know, the Huskies will hit you right in the mouth. Well, I didn't see a whole lot of hitting in the mouth going on. I saw a whole lot of unable to protect your quarterback. 
I saw a whole lot of him running around in circles trying to make a play happen. A lot of people don't like it when these upsets happen. First of all, I love them. Because number one, I love being proved right. I mean, the only game I really didn't see coming was Syracuse and Clemson. Nobody did. Come on, Lee Corso, right? Oh, when it was 7 nothing, and I went to bed, I knew Clemson was in trouble. Did you, Lee? Or did you go to bed thinking, ah, that's their gimme. It'll be fine. I'll wake up in the morning and the final score will be 52-10. to 10. I understand that Bryant got hurt in that game. And I'm not going to be one of those people that doesn't think that it didn't play a part into the Syracuse-Clemson win. But I will say that at the end of the day, Clemson is still Clemson. And they're still a scoring machine regardless of who's in. But over the years, you start looking at guys like Deshaun Watson and Taj Boyd, and it just it hasn't mattered. The part where I'm surprised is defensively, you would think that with Brian out, Clemson would be able to step up after all they did in the Auburn game. Shut them down. You believe that? When I start looking at that game, I, and people go, well, if Kelly Bryant would have been in, the only difference to me is that maybe they would have put up a few more points. And you still got to remember, at the end of the day, Clemson missed field goals. And by the way, the penalty yardage in that game, over 230 yards. Over 230 and accepted penalty yards, most of it to Clemson. You turn the ball over. Look, you got you to bring your A game when you go on the road. You've got a team that has nothing to lose. Packed out dome for the first time in years. Same thing with teams like Washington and Washington State. You're on the road. It doesn't matter that you're playing teams that aren't that good. That's how you get caught right there. I think Clemson just looked past Syracuse because of the beatdown that they put on them last season. Look, in the Pac-12, I don't think anybody ever looks over overlooks anybody because you can't. There's absolutely... No reason on earth why you should overlook anybody. But the reality of it is, though, is nobody can escape out of there. Big 12 football is kind of uh, right now. OU struggled with Texas last weekend. The shape of the college football landscape just completely altered in a single weekend. The very real reality of it is, is it needed to happen, number one. And why did it need to happen? Well, everybody's got a loss out of the way. I think there's less pressure. Everybody is Clemson out, is Clemson out. Look, dude, they had one loss last season. It doesn't really matter. You can get in with one loss now. That's one of the better part of the playoffs. Ohio State, one loss, playoff. Alabama, one loss, playoff. Clemson, one loss, playoff. It's not a big deal. Can we just stop freaking out already? I will say this. I'm a little a little struck by the new top 25 polls. I think some of these teams are going to be coming in uh, still a little bit overrated. Um, I think TCU is definitely one of those poll is one of those teams. I, I love defensively what they're capable of. But unfortunately, offensively, I'm not a fan of Kenny Hill, and I think he just turns the football over too much. But now here's your new top 25. Okay, this is what the AP poll is anyway. You got Bama, Penn State, Georgia, TCU, Wisconsin. Ohio State stays at the top at number six. Seven is Clemson, eight is Miami. Oklahoma's behind Ohio State despite beating them. And then you've got Oklahoma State rounding off your top ten. I can't believe Washington didn't take a bigger hit in Washington State. 12 and 15, you moved five and seven spots. How are you still even ranked after a game like that? By the way, Memphis now finally a top 25 team after they've not only beaten UCLA to this point in their backyard, but now they beat Navy. Navy was ranked number 25, only one loss going into that game on Saturday. Everything changed in a single weekend. But it changed for the better. Number one, this is what college football is all about. Upsets. The leveling of the playing field with the scholarships really played a big part into this. This is what we're seeing with the leveling of the scholarships. Remember, it used to be 100. Then they made it down to 75. It took a while, and I've been saying this, though, that the reason for all this is because of the the leveling of the playing field of the scholarships. Think about it. you got a decent quarterback. He's getting recruited. Oklahoma wants him. Nebraska wants him. 
Alabama wants him. And South Florida wants him. Well, if he goes to Alabama, Oklahoma, anywhere else, he's probably going to have to wait two years before he can be a starter, maybe even three, depending on how things go. I'll just go to South Florida, man. They'll redshirt me maybe for a year. Maybe I can start right away. Who knows? And then I'll be the guy for three or four years there. Really get my weight up, get my education, get playing time immediately. I can decide what I want to do my junior year. That's the leveling of the playing field. Because 15, 20 years ago, a weekend like this would have been boring. Washington would have cleaned house. Washington State would have cleaned house. OU and Texas would have been like the premier game. Everybody would have beat the hell out of everybody else. And it would have been like, eh, yawn, 50 to 10, whatever. Because of the leveling of the playing field with the scholarships, this is what we get to see now are weekends like this. And I think that they're great. I know they're disappointing for the team's fans, obviously. Look, what's the point to me going on and telling you about all these amazing things that happened in college football this weekend? Number one, this is what I love most about college football. The upsets, the startup teams. It's weekends like this that change recruiting for a lot of football teams. This is how it starts. Don't believe me? Ask Boise State. The other thing I'm telling you is it's the leveling of the playing field for scholarships. We're seeing it. We're not just seeing those typical dominant teams. I know that everybody's like year in and year out. They're going to point out Alabama. But Alabama's a different animal right now. Okay? And that's right now. Eventually, it'll go away. They're just having a dominant time, and that's all there is to it. But we see this eventually go away. And the beginning of the end is probably sooner than you think. And that's the other thing. This is why I want to see all the conferences to get a chance at the college football playoff. Memphis has beaten UCLA. South Florida remains undefeated. You've got teams right now that are in the top 25 that may finish the season undefeated and never get a chance to prove themselves. You had a 12-1 and Houston team a couple of years ago that ran through Florida State. You had Central Florida run through Baylor. The way that I have always viewed it is that the college football playoff should give any and every football team an opportunity out there to at least have a chance that if the record proves it, they should be in the playoff. And I think this season continues to prove that just because you're in a, quote, power conference, that doesn't mean that that automatically gives you the right to be there. They favor the conference champion. Okay, great. Let's get all the conference champions in and see what happens. Go with a top 16, which is predominantly going to be conference champions. Do something else, but I'm telling you right now, the way that it is is nonsense. Because if we're going to call these flute games or upsets or whatever it is you want to call them and totally disregard these other schools as a result of that, well, I just don't understand the logic behind it. And I don't know how anybody can. If Washington and Washington State are susceptible enough to be beaten by Cal and Arizona State. Let's say one of those two teams make it out of the Pac-12 alive with only one loss. USC struggle with a Texas team right now that's already lost three total games this year. One of them has been to Maryland. The other one to them, obviously, now to OU. Don't you think that they're susceptible enough to be beaten by a Memphis team that's already beaten one of their own in UCLA? By the way, three years in a row now, they have beaten top 25 teams in their own backyard, including twice this season alone. Those are home games. Those are different. No, those are big games. You don't think Miller's not a good wide receiver or Ferguson's not a good quarterback? Have you seen Memphis play? They're a hell of a football team. And if we're going to justify conference play and go, well, it's conference play for these other teams and, you know, da-da-da-da-da, well, then when Memphis or somebody else likes that, gets into conference play and struggles a little bit. Shouldn't we take that into consideration as well? This whole narrative about how well coaches all know each other. and It all flies for the big boys, right? And not for that little guy over here. Well, here's the thing. All right, dude, whatever. Say whatever's convenient for you, bro. I would take the AAC right now over the Pac-12. You damn right I would. 
the AACs competed with teams like Notre Dame, UCLA, Auburn. This is the Full Court Press. I'm your host, Drew Duncan. You're checking me out live from the K-Sun Studios in Wichita, Kansas. I am on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, all at DrewDuncan83. Don't forget, you listen all day, every day at ksunradio.org. That's ksunradio.org. We're going to take a real quick sponsor break. We'll be come back on the flip side. NFL upsets. Got a lot to talk about today, guys. The Denver Broncos fall into the New York Giants. Kansas City Chiefs get run over by the Pittsburgh Steelers. We'll be back right after this. Don't you dare touch that dial. <laughs> 